Suzanne was always, she was always very sporty. Always very sporty, very independent, always had lots of friends. Suzanne had an absolute cracking job, something she really, really enjoyed. She passed an awful lot of exams at the firm that she was at. She bought a house on her own, like a part boy, part rent house. I mean, she'd worked really hard. She wouldn't just put herself out for anybody and always put other people in, in front of herself. She was a really, really good mum as well. She absolutely adored Chloe. They were so close. It was nice because it was the two of us and next door she had like her best friend that she knew and my best friend also lived next door and it was nice. We were such a close-knit family. We went on holiday together, you know, we did more everything together. Chloe was just our grandchild and we absolutely adored her. So I don't know, we'd push the sofas together in the living room and watch a film downstairs with the popcorn that we bought on the Friday night. That was like every week. He was very athletic. He wasn't very tall, but he was very muscular. He was a different character. He wasn't like the people that she used to date. We were told by Suzanne that he was a trainer and he trained boxers. I just remember him being there more and more. She would go to my parents' house every day because my dad would take Chloe to school and pick her up, but that completely stopped. We would always go to my parents on a Sunday for Sunday dinner, um, but she quickly stopped coming. She kind of just gently like took herself out of like the family unit. But she just said, oh, you know, it's my little family now. I've got my own little family and we're doing things as a family together. Within six weeks of that relationship, she contacted a neighbour to say that she's had an argument with John Morton. Sue was crying. She said that John had kicked off, grabbed her by the throat, which you could see the marks around her throat, squeezed that hard that it felt like she couldn't breathe. And her neighbour, quite rightly said, you know, you need to leave this individual. But Suzanne appeared to make excuses for his behaviour and she went home and back to that relationship. He'd actually been assessed for mental health and on one occasion he'd actually been sectioned and diagnosed with schizophrenia. I knew he was on medication because we went to town one time to pick up his medication and he just said, oh, he gave it to me and he said, put that in that hole. There was a hole in the bricks when we walked past, he said, just put that in there. He chucked it out. There's also a suggestion that he took recreational drugs as well as alcohol. Mixing that concoction together is, is a bit of a recipe for disaster. You should see him hit her all the time. Like, not all the time, but more than a child should see someone hitting their parent. It wasn't like it was a gradual thing where he just gets angry and angry. It was literally like one minute he'd be sat there on his phone and the next minute he'd be hitting you. I went into the back garden and heard Sue in her garden crying. I looked over the fence, her face, nose, her eye and her cheek were swollen and starting to bruise. She had a cut on her foot that was bleeding. I asked if she was okay, if she wanted me to ring someone, family or the police. She said no, she needs to handle it. There was a time that he said that I looked at him weirdly. So I wasn't allowed in the house because I looked in a certain way. So it, he kicked us out and I think we slept in a park for a night. Because I didn't live too far from Suzanne's, I would always drive past Suzanne's house and I'd be checking to see if her car was on the drive. Um, and I'd notice that the car wasn't there any longer and it hadn't been there for a couple of weeks. Chloe was taken out of school and she never said a word. We just left and that was, that was it, we just went. She lost her house and she moved in uh, with him. Um, so she, she lost everything. That evening I went to the police station with my parents and I reported Suzanne as missing. 
a police officer said to me that I needed to get my sister out of that of where she was and I said to that police, that police officer I don't know where my sister is I said I can't get her out where is she and they said I can't tell you where she is but you need to get her out I went to bed and then I couldn't sleep so I'd asked my mum to come back and like help me go to sleep and like she took me into bed and she said you know it's like fine like I love you and that's the last thing I remember. And then I remember her on the floor, just so the bed, and she was just like by the door. I remember him being on top of her and putting something in her mouth and strangling her. So I said, why is she getting up? Like, what's wrong with that? And he was, oh, she's just sleeping. And he'd poured like water on her or something. And then I said, you need to call, the, you need to call an ambulance. And he got the TV remote and just dialed on and on the remote. And I knew that wasn't right, like, but I also knew if I did it, I'd, that could happen to me. So he just said, go to sleep. She'll be up in the morning, it's fine, you're just sleeping. And then I woke up in the morning and he was in the living room. I, at first I thought he was asleep. Um, and then neither of them were moving or anything. I was scared that if I called an ambulance and he woke up, I'd get told off. So I was pacing for ages and then I finally called. On the 8th of February 2013, at about 9.50 in the morning, they received a 999 call from a young girl saying that her daddy is believed dead and bleeding from the mouth and also mother is dead as well and they came and the police were telling me to like leave we'll put you in the car and i didn't want to leave i was like no like i wanted to save my mom they discovered that john was in the front room with a, a sheet over him and was clearly deceased and did have blood coming out of his mouth. And then when they were led upstairs by Chloe, they found Suzanne, who was in her bedroom, just against the bed. I'd just come in from golf, and I'd literally would just walk through the door, and two police officers uh, came into the, the house, and they said, are you Suzanne's father? And I said, yes, and he said, I'm sorry, but I've got some bad news. I walked into the foyer and she looked at me and she said, Suzanne. I said, yes. And she said, she's dead. And I said, yes, both of them. Um, and she thought I meant Chloe. Um, but I said, no, no, it was John. The police officer who was leading the investigation had come with one of the um, liaison officers to explain, you know, what he thought had happened. They established that both John and Suzanne had a fatal dose of PMA in them, which is a very high strain of ecstasy. It's actually known as Dr. Death or Killer as a street name. We knew Suzanne would never ever take drugs. That is not, you know, the person that Suzanne was. And we said this to the police and the Eliza's officer said to us, well, you didn't know your sister at the end. Our goal was to prove that Suzanne was not a drug addict, that she was a victim of domestic violence and coercion. We knew it wasn't the truth, um, and it wouldn't be fair on Suzanne. But finally, we managed to get a, uh, 
a reinvestigation done. It took us three, four years of lobbying, letter writing, kicks in the teeth. So Suzanne died in the February 13, and it was August of 16 that we uh, managed to get this, this um, investigation. On behalf of West Midlands Police, I wish to apologise for a number of failings by the force in the handling of Suzanne's case, both before and after her death, and to acknowledge the immense additional distress this has caused to Suzanne's family. We have got justice for Suzanne, but the only, the only thing I wanted, for me personally, I wanted her death certificate to represent that. And I think until that has been the truth on her death certificate, um, I don't think, you know, I could rest. <laughs>